Nick DeVries has had a horrible start to 2023. He hasn't impressed with his speed or racecraft. His results have been bad to say the least as he currently sits last in the championship after four races. And in Baku he crashed twice during the weekend, one of which took him out of the race. To put it bluntly, the disappointment with this start comes down to expectations. De Vries is not your average run-of-the-mill rookie in his early 20s that's had some success in Formula 2. He is a very experienced driver that is three years older than both Leclerc and Verstappen. He has won championships in Formula 2 and Formula E. And all of that context is why, to me, he has almost been worse relative to expectations than Nikita Mazepin was in 2021. There's no doubt that Mazepin on paper had a worse start to 2021 than De Vries has had in 2023. I mean, he qualified last and finished last on track in each of his first four races. But the thing with Mazepin is that, firstly, the 2021 Haas was just a flat-out bad car. It was difficult to drive with both rookies having crashes and spins throughout the season, and this was also the year that Haas basically sacrificed all of 2021 and put all of their resources on the 2022 car for the brand new regs. But despite that, there was absolutely zero expectations. No one expected Mazepin to be anything other than what he turned out to be. Absolutely abysmal. That is why to me De Vries almost feels worse than Mazepin at the moment because even though on paper he hasn't been, his experience and his pedigree has meant that he came in with pretty high expectations and that is why it makes the start of the season feel even worse than it really is. In Bahrain, he had a totally anonymous weekend. He qualified P19 over 7 tenths away from Yuki and then in the race despite finishing in P14, everyone behind him either retired or had some kind of issues. Jeddah was a total write-off that I actually don't blame too much on him. He was the only driver on the grid that had never driven around Jeddah, which is the absolute worst scenario around a tight and fast street track where all of the walls are unforgiving. On top of that, he also had reliability issues throughout practice, which meant that his already minimal track time got even smaller. In the end, he qualified in P18, only three tenths behind Yuki, which actually isn't too bad, and just brought it home in P14 with no drama. Australia actually looked like the first signs of genuine progress. He got into Q2 for the first time, qualifying in P15, only two tenths away from Yuki, and then the race was a mixed bag. He was more in the pack, which was promising, but he also got caught up in a few incidents and in the end got completely wiped out by Logan Sargent on the final restart. Even though Australia seemed like progress, Baku was a disaster to say the least. In practice, he actually finished in 6th, but it was all downhill from there. He crashed out almost immediately in qualifying and didn't set a representative lap time. During the sprint, he was completely anonymous, just trying to rebuild his confidence. And then during the race, he made a really silly error, clipping the inside barrier at turn 5, taking him out of the race. When you take everything into account, De Vries has just felt like the worst of the three rookies so far because the lens that we use to judge him is more harsh compared to Logan or Oscar. When it comes to Oscar Piastri, I have been really impressed with his performances so far. His qualifying gap to Lando has been really encouraging after what McLaren experienced with Ricardo, and I don't want to say too much more because I definitely will take a closer look at Oscar in a dedicated video coming soon. Logan has been less impressive. He's definitely got ability and he's definitely shown glimpses of quality, but he's really struggled to put it all together over a clean weekend. A few incidents are also now starting to creep in. Crashing and qualifying in Jeddah, needlessly crashing into the back of De Vries in Australia, and then also clipping the wall in Baku during sprint quali. But that's just the thing. At 22, I expect those mistakes from Logan. It doesn't make them right, and if he doesn't improve, then he himself will come under pressure from Williams, but compared alongside De Vries, his mistakes are a lot more easier to digest because we know what we have, an inexperienced driver who is still getting used to the pressures of delivering at an elite level. The reason why I have talked a lot about the expectations that have surrounded Nick 
is because he was kind of pinched by Red Bull out of nowhere. I made a video earlier in the year before the season began talking about Nick, in which I said that I have never seen the perception of a driver change overnight as much as it did for Nick after Monza last year. Before Monza, he was just the guy that every mercedes powered team would throw into their car for FP1 to satisfy the need for a young driver, which seems ironic given that he's 27. But then all of a sudden, he got this surprise call up to Williams, and make no mistake, he grabbed that opportunity with both hands, scoring points, and overnight, he became the most wanted driver in Formula 1. Williams wanted him, Alpine were ready to give him a test, and then in the end with Gasly leaving Alpha Tauri, Helmut Marko kind of snapped him up out of nowhere. I think in the eyes of Red Bull, with Gasly gone, who was Alpha Tauri's dependable, experienced point scorer, Nick was almost the safe option. I think it was almost taken for granted that he would play that Gasly role of being the solid, reliable driver at Alpha Tauri, which gives a bit more freedom and a bit more breathing room to Yuki on the other side of the garage. However, 2023 has been the complete opposite. Yuki has stepped it up big time. I actually think that when you look at Yuki in the championship in P16 on two points, I don't think that does him justice with how well he's performed so far. In my opinion, he's been better than Zhou, he's been better than Gasly, he's been better than Bottas, and despite a poor car, he has taken up that Gasly role of being a team leader, a semi-consistent point scorer pretty well, and it's De Vries who is now looking more and more like the rookie on the ropes. What makes it even more tricky, and again Yuki is the absolutely best example, is that the whole point of sticking it out with a struggling young driver who does have talent whilst you help develop them is that they should have a pretty decent ceiling to get to. With De Vries, because he's already 27 years old, I am not saying that he can't get better because of course he can, he's only done 5 Grand Prix but his ceiling and his potential just won't be as high. Nick was supposed to be almost the finished article with his experience. He was supposed to be the safe option compared to picking up a young driver from Formula 2 that might not be ready yet. But if there's one thing that we've learned about Red Bull and Helmut Marko, just because you've got a contract for 2023 doesn't mean that Red Bull are afraid to give you the boot if they feel that the seat could be better served with someone else. That also brings me on to another point, which is, on top of the pressure of performing in Formula 1, on top of the pressure of going up against a teammate who has really stepped it up, and on top of the pressure of getting off to a bad start like he has, there is some serious talent in the lower formula that is also gunning for his seat. The two most likely drivers are Ayumu Owasa in Formula 2 and Liam Lawson racing in Super Formula. Despite a rough weekend last time out in Baku for Ayumu Owasa, make no mistake he is one of the favourites for the Formula 2 title, currently sitting third in the championship and being one of only two drivers to take two wins so far. Liam Lawson similarly won on his Super Formula debut and also sits third in that championship. It is still very early days for all of these drivers including Nick De Vries. Around the summer break is when the temperature is really going to get cranked up to the max. Sometimes all it takes is just one result, one points finish to settle your nerves and begin the ball rolling. But make no mistake, when you race for Red Bull and under the eye of Helmut Marko, your F1 future can disappear in an instant. If Nick can't start showing the qualities that made him a Formula 2 and Formula E champion and continues to underperform, it's not beyond the realms of possibility that, before the summer break, he could be gone.